So I will start by apologizing because it's very difficult to prepare a talk for a bunch of people like you that we don't know if there are mathematicians, computer scientists, biologists, because you are a mix of everything. Myself, I don't know what I am. I am a biologist, as, uh, as Anais said, and then I switched to bioinformatics a long time ago now, but still I'm not coding. I'm just having, trying to get nice ideas. And so what I will present to you, I, so I, what I choose to do today is in fact to present you two pieces of work that we have done in the lab and, um, and I will illustrate as, as, as uh, the, the, the talk will go, I will illustrate more deeply the data we have used for this work and uh, so every time you will see a red border on the slide, it will be the, the let's say, the more uh, data part. And so don't hesitate to, uh, to ask questions and uh, to yell if you need or whatever. Okay, so uh, the title is here to, yeah, to tell you that we are working mainly on protein-protein interaction network, in fact. So what we are interested to, to tackle with uh, this uh, network study, in fact, is uh, biological complexity. And um, so here you have, uh, I like this slide because, because these animals are fun. And because you can see here that from the size of the genome, you cannot, uh, uh, you, you are not able to deduce about the complexity of, uh, of uh, the organism you are looking at. So here the human is here, for instance, but it has a much smaller genome than the onion or the amoeba. So what we want to try to understand is from where this biological complexity is coming from, take into account the size of the pieces we have. And the pieces which are encoded by the genome, they are represented by this mess, as uh, Julio said. So here you have some uh, illustration of uh, some uh, of the, the, uh, of the, the um, uh, biological systems you can find uh, in the cell. And so this, uh, these are paintings, in fact, by David Goodsell, who is a, a, um, working in, a, he's a structuralist and he's also a painter. And uh, uh, so he has made a lot of neat representation here that I will uh, use all along the talk. So in fact, these biological systems are made from parts which are encoded by the genomes and uh, they have functions that the part themselves alone don't have. So here you see uh, the notion of complexity and I hope that I will uh, show you that by studying these networks, we are able to uh, get a little uh, uh, at least little insight about this biological complexity. So uh, mainly network biology, so this is why network biology is about so complexity, the functions of the systems that I presented here, and the systems, as I said, are made by the part encoded by the genomes, which are interacting through molecular interactions. So here, during all the, all the talk, molecular interactions will be, uh, will be uh, the, the main topic, in fact. So here, see the red, so these are uh, details about molecular interactions. So uh, the um, proteins, which are uh, uh, most of the, 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 the main 
a large part of the actors of the cell never act alone, but they interact with other molecules to perform uh, their functions. So you have several part of, uh, several types of interactions, interactions in between proteins, in between proteins and nucleic acids like RNA or here protein DNA. And during the talk, I will speak about mainly now on protein-protein interactions, but also later on protein-RNA interactions. So uh, I, I, I'm making this focus on, um, on uh, these interactions because these are, uh, when you study protein-protein interaction network, you have to somehow, if you want to get biological insight from it, you have to take into account that protein-protein uh, interactions are very diverse. And they are diverse at several levels. In fact, they are diverse in terms of, a, of a, they have a structural diversity because a functional proteins can be made by identical uh, proteins, or like here the ferritin, or some other proteins, whereas some other proteins will be uh, um, um, other complexes, will be made by polypeptides, which are all different, like the RNA polymerase here. You have a, a diversity also in terms of uh, function, because and in term of uh, yeah, in term of function, because here, to for instance, here you have the proteins which participate to uh, this uh, signaling pathways, and in fact, the uh, interactions of these proteins are non-obligate for the function, meaning that uh, the function are uh, uh, insured by a protein which is interacting with uh, another one, but uh, the, the, the proteins can exist in the cell alone and they are stable and they can assure the function alone. Whereas some other proteins will be stable in the, uh, the, the, the cell only when they interact with other protein, like here in the uh, uh, ribosome, and these interactions are necessary for the function. Then you have the third type of diversity, which is coming from uh, the dynamic, uh, because here in the uh, signaling pathway, you will have interactions which are transient. So you will have a kinase phosphorylating uh, its substrate, for instance, so it, to ensure its function, whereas for other uh, 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 complexes, then you will need to have uh, a permanent uh, interactions in order for the complex to uh, perform its cellular function. So now, how protein do interact with each other? So there are mainly two kind of, uh, uh, um, two kind of uh, um, protein interactions. You have proteins which are mediated by domains. So domains, they are part of sequences that form, form uh, most of them, a compact three-dimensional structure. They can form, function, and evolve independently. And most of the protein have several are composed of several domains. Here, this is just a, a representation uh, to, to show you the, the diversity uh, of uh, the, 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 pro, the domains within the proteins which can be uh, involved in protein-protein interaction. Then the second way of proteins to interact with each other, it's through motif domain interactions. So a motif is a short stretch of amino acid from three to 10, which is 
which often reside in part of the proteins which are not structure, so not in domain, but in linkers of domain, and often in a region of proteins which are considered as disordered, meaning they don't have any structure. And these uh, small motifs are able to interact with domains of other proteins at low affinity. And in fact, these uh, small motifs, they mediate interactions which are transient. And we consider then, so it means that when we use high throughput uh, method to identify protein-protein interactions, most of the time we are not able to, uh, to, to see such interactions. And so uh, in the human proteome, it has been estimated that uh, there should be something like one million of motifs. So here you can see motifs which have been, uh, which have been uh, defined based on uh, alignment and they are transduced, let's say, uh, computationally as regular expression. And as soon as we have a regular expression, which can be here you have the grammar of uh, this regular expression, then you can look for the presence, the presence of this motif in, uh, within the proteins. So here you have uh, the main database of short linear motifs, which are also named eukaryotic linear motifs. And uh, in fact, in this database, what you will find is uh, 3,500 uh, instances of motifs which have been curated from the literature, meaning that those motifs have been uh, defined <coughs> experimentally and then found uh, in the proteomes. So these motifs, they are important because in fact they have different type of, uh, of functions. They can, <coughs> uh, they can mediate uh, um, modification because they can be phosphorylated, for instance. They can mediate ligation, so protein protein interactions, cleavage, or trigger uh, some processes. Here I put some numbers in order for you to have uh, uh, an idea of uh, what is happening in the human proteome. So, as I said, so the, the, so the, the binding motifs are. Uh, um, 100,000, 1 million of amino acids in uh, the proteome are considered to be uh, phosphorylable or, or at least uh, uh, modified by post-translational uh, modification. We are having in our proteome something like 35 thousand globular domains forming our proteins. And uh, recently, the number of protein complexes in the cell uh, have been estimated based on uh, the reanalysis of all the uh, mass spec, uh, um, the mass spec uh, analysis of protein complexes as being something like almost 5,000 protein complexes in the cell involving 7,000 uh, proteins and uh, in which they have identified 56,000 unique interactions. Okay, so now how can we uh, detect protein-protein uh, interaction at large scale? So uh, most of, the, uh, of this method, so basically there are two type of, uh, of uh, uh, experiments. The experiments which will identify what we call binary interactions, meaning this protein is interacting with this other, other protein, and most of the time this is a direct interaction. So this uh, method, are based on the uh, on the uh, on the uh, complement on the complementation <laughs> on the genetic complementation, meaning that uh, in fact, if here this is the used to hybrid, for instance, this is the one which is the most 
uh, known if there is an interaction in between the two proteins that you are interested in, then you are reconstituting an activity that you can monitor at the cell level. So this activity can be uh, uh, some, uh, uh, most of the time you are producing some kind of, uh, uh, some kind of uh, fluorescence like uh, here or here or here you will uh, be able to uh, modify the substrate uh, of, uh, of uh, uh, an enzyme which is reconstituted by uh, the interactions when the interaction is, is, uh, is happening. So in, in some other uh, um, methods, then you will be able to, you will, uh, when you have the interaction, then you will be able to uh, reconstitute some um, um, signaling pathway, and then you can monitor uh, somehow the output of the pathway. And then the second part, the second uh, type of a, of of a uh, method is identifying not binary interactions, but protein complexes. And this, um, this uh, method, most of the time, uh, uh, correspond to a um, method in which with an antibody, or we are able to recognize a particular protein called bait, and all the protein it is able to interact with. And then this complex is purified by mass spectrometry, and then uh, we are able to uh, identify all the components of the complexes. Okay, so in fact, what is important in, in, in this slide, more than uh, this, uh, all this technical detail, is to realize that all method has their advantage, and their limitation, and that in fact there is no good method because uh, there is no all method. This is from the the, um, the addition of the results of several method that you can get a protein-protein interaction network, which is the more uh, precise, which is more precise. Because in fact, here, you can see, so these are uh, quite old experiments now, but here, this is in uh, uh, Mark Vidal's lab, they have, uh, in fact, in order, the question they, they asked was, uh, are we able, so what is the, uh, the coverage of the, uh, the interactome that we can uh, that we can um, uh, decipher through large scale to hybrid screen and uh, all the methods that I've shown you. I I'm speaking here only about binary. And in fact, so because at the beginning of the interactome uh, story, a lot of people, uh, so the people started with the large scale experiment and uh, in fact, they uh, to validate the, the the quality of their interaction network. They were looking within these interactions to. They were looking for interactions which have been uh, um, identified by other type of method. Let's say low scale experiment, the regular uh, biochemical methods that the the biochemist is doing at the bench. And for a lot of uh, uh, a lot of uh, these interactions, in fact, they were not found among the ones that was were already known. So the conclusion was: so this uh, method are generating crap, and they are uh, generating a lot of uh, a lot of uh, false positive. So we had the feeling that in fact, we knew that in fact it was not the case. So they had to, uh, uh, they have designed this experiment in order to show that the problem with this screen were not the false positive, but the false negative. So for this, so meaning that we were in a space of interactions which were so huge that in fact we were never uh, uh, we were never able to identify all the protein protein interactions. 
And to do that, what they have done, they have taken a hundred of binary interactions, which are kind of gold standard. Everybody knows this, Foss and June, for instance. And they have taken a hundred of other interaction at random, which was not existing. And they try to get these interactions with different kind of a, of, a, of a method. And as you can see here, some interactions, there, there are only this, let's say, ten, tens of uh, interactions over the hundred which that, that all method are able to find. So, and here you can see that uh, the false positive, in fact, are not that numerous. But here, they are, no matter what method you use, there are a lot of interactions that you are not able to, uh, to uh, identify. So, in fact, the result of this kind of analysis showed us that if we want to have a good interactome to work with and to get biology out of it, we have to take interactions coming from all sort of method. And this is what we are doing. So here I showed you, uh, so then, <clears throat> uh, because uh, there are so many interactions, in fact, all the databases uh, get together uh, in order to, first of all, to reduce the number of paper to be curated, to be coherent, or uh, the, the, the one with the other, and also to provide standards because the better way of getting right, the right information into database is to have the interaction provider to send their results because they know it. So uh, this is the, the, the goal of this international uh, consortium. So the main databases uh, of interactions are uh, intact, which is at the EBI in, uh, in Inkston uh, in UK, and Mint is in Roma, and so the, the other one, and there is also BioGrid, the American one, but as usual, they don't participate to the consortium. They are only observer since years, and they still do not participate completely. So here are the numbers for uh, coming from the intact database. So they have, so you can see how many uh, binary interactions, more than one, I don't know, more than one million, 60% of which are binary interaction of uh, human protein. So this means that we have almost 600 uh, thousand binary interactions in human available, which have been identified experimentally. Okay, so then once you have this, uh, all these interactions, what do you do with this? Then you draw a network. But as Julio said, Networks do not exist. So in fact, I'm sorry to tell you that we will speak about non-existing things for one week. But uh, so you know that uh, they, so what they do represent, and this is important for the rest of the talk, is the set of all possible protein-protein interaction between the protein of an organism. And because all these interactions, as I told you, have been identified from different, in different conditions, with different experiments, etc. There is, in this protein-protein interaction network, most of the time, no spatial temporal information. And this is why a lot of biologists said, you cannot do anything with this because you don't have this kind of information, which is the more important. Okay, so here, just to remind you that Network, why network do not exist? They do not exist because as biologists, we start with the data, which are observation or measures, and the network are just representation of this data. 
And this is because these networks can be represented as graph, and so which are a mathematical object and an abstraction, then we can get back to the biology. And so this is, as a network biologist, this is what we are doing. We start from the data, represent them as network, analyze them as graph, and then go back to the biology. Okay, so let's go back to uh, the interactome. So if you want to get biological insight from this, you cannot, uh, you cannot do it like this because this is a big mess. So uh, based on um, some principal papers in, uh, back in the, in the uh, year, in the previous century, then uh, the, uh, the notion of a functional module is very important in order to, because it had, uh, uh, this notion has allowed, in fact, to, uh, uh, I don't know how to tell it in English. Uh, it, it allowed, in fact, the, the people to think about the algorithm that they will develop to, uh, uh, to extract biology for, from it. So this is why the, the, in, the, the uh, definition of the functional modules are very important. So they are discrete entity whose function is separable from those of other modules. They can be insulated from or connected to each other, and this is very important, and also as we are biologists, we know that a given component may belong to different modules at different times. So based on this, several types of algorithm have been uh, developed by a lot of group in the world. And um, so using classification methods based on diverse kind of a, a graph parameter, like the density, distance in between nodes, edge between us, between this cut, or uh, by <laughs> optimizing modularity uh, criterion. So in fact, once the network have been partitioned with, uh, with this method, what we have checked is that in fact this uh, what we have called functional modules within the graph, they indeed do correspond to discrete entities which are answering cellular process because they are a group of tightly linked proteins which are involved in the same biological processes. And this has been demonstrated at the beginning of all this, uh, of this stuff. And we know also that uh, they, they are mainly conserved during the evolution. So once you have uh, functional modules with this, or, or with this uh, uh, algorithm, then you can do several types of things. Either you can predict the function of a protein in a biological process, because if I don't know what this guy is doing, if I know that all these guys are involved in the blue function, then this one is involved in the blue function, and also, what is interesting is that as you are able to investigate the whole network, then if you get some, uh, into some, uh, some new biological processes or some mechanism that you are interested in, then you can have an idea of the prevalence of the mechanism at the network scale. So I will uh, present to you two, as I told you, two, uh, uh, two parts of a our work and illustrate this notion through uh, this work. So first, I work about the moonlighting proteins, and I will uh, and I will explain in a second what are moonlighting proteins, and also uh, a work on the uh, scaffolding of RNA. But it will be on the second part on protein RNA interaction. Okay. So what are uh, protein, moonlighting proteins. So moonlighting proteins, they are a weird thing. I told you at the beginning that the 
proteins, they were ensuring a function. So it's relatively uh, uh, easy as a, as a definition. But in fact, some, they are, we don't know how they are, how many they are, but there are a lot of proteins which have a secondary job in addition to the regular one. So in French, it will be travailler au noir. So these guys, they, have, they are known to have a function, but in fact, in some conditions, they are doing something completely different. Completely different. So this is what I mean, meant here by perform multiple and unrelated function. So unrelated, we have to be humble. This is in the limit and in the frame of our current knowledge, okay? And so, because they are weird, obviously they have been uh, discovered by serendipity and by the unexpected convergence of uh, experimental results. So I give you an example. So here, there is the aconitase. So this is an enzyme of the Krebs cycle, which is uh, changing the citrate into isocitrate. In some conditions, the higher the, so this, this is an enzyme which is folded into an iron uh, cluster. When the concentration in iron is dropping into the cell, then the protein is becoming a regulation of the translation. And it's not an enzyme anymore, but it becomes an RNA binding protein. It's uh, binding, to, binding to the mRNA, which is encoding uh, for proteins which are important for the sequestration and the usage of iron into the cell. And the protein is doing this because its structure is changing. So here, the, uh, the functional change is in fact due to the change in conformation. So these proteins, they are interesting also because in fact, there are a lot of cases of such uh, proteins in pathological uh, situation, and particularly in cancer. So you have some proteins which ha are having a function in the normal cell, the normal nuclei here, this RAM protein here, which is important for uh, the uh, stability of the mitotic spindle. And in some tumor, this protein, is found at the surface of the cell where it's triggering a signaling pathway which ultimately is activating the uh, 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 genes which are important for the development of metastasis. Then, so here in the two cases I told you, you have the same protein which is involved in very unrelated function. But then we, you have also very weird cases like those, the crystallines. In the dark, the lens of the eye is made by the aggregate of the lactate deshydrogenase. Whereas in the fish, this is the enolase, which is an enzyme which is important which is uh, uh, an enzyme from the glycolysis. And in human, this is again something else, which is, this is a chaperone, uh, a HAC protein, which is making our lens. So here we have the same function, which through the evolution has recruited several proteins. Why? Because all, all these proteins have the same physical property, which is when they are interacting with, the, with each other as aggregate, they are transparent. And all this, this in fact, this biological weirdness or is, is, not, is not really well known. So what we have, what we have asked as questions is, as they are discovered by serendipity, there are no identification method. So 
we cannot uh, do a systematic search whereas this protein may be very in, in, interesting because they may have regulatory and evolutionary role, as I, I showed you. They can help us to understand genotype to phenotype relationships, and uh, they, they can help to understand drug side effect as well, because if you know only one function of a protein and you block it somehow with a drug, if it has uh, another function, you better know it, otherwise you will have a secondary effect. So these are the questions that we have asked. How to identify monolithic proteins from network analysis, and we are interested in the determinants of this monolithic uh, uh, capacity and the molecular mechanism which are regulating this monolithic stuff. So for this, this is the reasoning. You remember that I told you that the people who didn't like protein-protein interaction network. They didn't like it because they were saying there is no special temporal information within the stuff. You will never do uh, extract any uh, relevant biological information. Except that for the moonlighting proteins, this is a good thing to be devoid of special temporal information because moonlighting proteins should belong, be involved in different biological processes, which can happen in very different conditions. And so in terms of graph, they should belong to several functional modules, which are involved in different functions. So then we propose a large scale identification method for these proteins that we have uh, renamed extreme multifunctional proteins, but don't ask why. So these are, these are uh, I can explain, but it's not important. Um, okay, from the network, so let's go. So, what? <laughs> okay, so then, so the first reasoning that I told you, these proteins, extreme multifunctional proteins, though they are EMF, should belong to several functional modules, so this is what we have said. So first of all, we should identify overlapping modules within the graph, because they should be at the intersection, okay? So this, when we started this work, it was quite a long time ago, uh, it, it was not possible with the uh, uh, algorithm which have been developed at this period to do such a thing. They were, they were leading to partitioning only meaning that one protein could not belong to two, uh, uh, to two clusters. Whereas belonging to two clusters, as biologists, we know that this is, this is what is important because it can be a regulator or it can, be, it can help you to uh, identify the core complex and auxiliary proteins. So we developed with uh, uh, Alain Genoche, with whom you will go to the Calanque in two days. Who is here? Uh, we developed a, a new method that we have called overlapping cluster generator method, which allowed us first to cover the graph with an overlapping system, cluster systems, so small clicks, in fact, that we fuse iterat iteratively by, in fact, uh, optimizing uh, a criteria, which is the modularity of the whole set of clusters. So here is just a rapid animation to, tell, to explain the principle of uh, the algorithm. So, uh, so these are, this is what I just told you. And so we started with a graph completely covered by small clicks, and then we fuse as we optimize the, uh, the, the modularity of the complete set of clusters up to the point that the modularity of the set of clusters is maximum. Then when it goes down, then we stop the algorithm and we get the clusters. Okay, so by doing this, we, had, we are here. Then we wanted to know to what, uh, bio, in what biological processes these uh, 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 clusters are involved in. 
So for this, we use a regular uh, majority rule uh, of uh, annotation using geoterms. Do you know what are geoterms? Yes, no, yes, 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 yes. Okay, so we go fast. So I took this from, uh, uh, from uh, the geo people. So it's an ontology, which there are three ontologies, in fact, in, in uh, geoterms. The geoterms have been made in, the, in, the, uh, in 2000, to, the ontology have been made in 2000 to describe in uh, um, um, controlled, as a controlled vocabulary, the uh, functions, the different functions of genes or proteins. So uh, you will have, and they are, and, it, and, and it's organized as a, a, a DAG, a direct acyclic graph. And so from here, you are going to, you can see it for the biological process to the less specific concept, to the more con specific concept. So as I said, there are three, um, uh, three uh, ontology, one which is uh, describing the biological process is the molecular function of the proteins and the cellular component in which they have been found. And there are several type of relationships in between uh, the, uh, the, the annotations and the concepts. So this, the, the, uh, this uh, is used now by all the main databases uh, describing all the gene and proteins for all the organism. And uh, as you can see here, for one instance, so this is the alpha enolase, in the, so this is in the next what uh, database, you can have uh, tons of uh, this annotation here for all this, uh, uh, <clears throat> all this uh, pro proteins and all these terms, and they have been uh, uh, based on different kind of data, most of them experimental. So uh, to get back to our problem, we needed, if you remember well, we needed to, uh, uh, to identify modules which are involved in unrelated functions. So to do this, we use a statistical trick and we looked for uh, uh, the co-occurrence of the terms within the, uh, the, the, within the annotation of single proteins. The idea being that two terms which are often found together within the annotation of single proteins have a better chance to describe uh, uh, processes which are related than two terms which are never or very rarely found uh, within the annotation of a same protein. So we have computed all this thing, we have made a database with it, and we used it to uh, annotate our clusters. And once we have annotated our clusters based on the, uh, uh, the, the majority rule that I told you, and then apply the, the uh, pronto probability, then we have our candidates. So these candidates, the first time we made the experiment, we, had, we got 3% of the interacton proteins as potential moonlighting candidates. So because of this, so then it's, uh, so it was uh, 430 candidates. So it was a, a neat number to try to get some signature for these proteins. And so first of all, we looked at the function they were involved in, and the, what were the decimal processes in which they were, they were involved. And it was, Quite, uh, we were quite happy with this result. Here you can see you have metabolism all along this, the, the, this column here, and here different type of, uh, of, uh, uh, of processes, and we were quite happy about this because most of the well-known 
uh, moonlighting proteins are in fact very ancient evolutionary proteins which are proteins from the metabolism. And here, so this is the representation of the signature for, for uh, this particular, uh, these weird proteins. So in fact, these are all the, uh, the, the features that we have tested and we have compared our candidates, which are here represented in blue, with the multi-clustered proteins, but which are not candidate, <clears throat> and the uh, protein of the network. And as you can see, something uh, very, and here, so this is the same idea, but we have compared to the blue, the, the green, sorry, uh, uh, line here represent the hubs. So meaning the proteins which are the most uh, um, uh, connected within the network. And so what we have found is that, in fact, our proteins, they are super hubs. They are much more, uh, um, uh, connected than the protein which are not candidate and the hubs. So they have obviously then more domains, they are more conserved, they are more uh, blah, blah, blah. But what is interesting, very interesting is this. So you remember what are ELM, eukaryotic linear motifs. So these proteins, so why this is interesting? Because first, what strikers the at first was here. Hubs, they are proteins which are interacting with tons of proteins in the network, and because of this, they are usually disordered. They, 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 they are not organized, well organized in domain, but most of the time, they, they organize upon intera interactions, and they are uh, uh, disordered proteins. And we realize that, in fact, we had super hubs, but which were not disordered. So it was, it was weird. So then we reasoned that what can be different in between this thing, maybe this is the content of the disorder in these short linear motifs. I told you that these short linear motifs are involved in interactions and at low affinity and are mainly located within disordered regions. And in fact, the density in short linear motifs within the disorder of our candidates is higher than within the hubs. Meaning that this uh, uh, um, uh, property, this feature, may be something uh, uh, very interesting for the moonlighting and maybe a clue of uh, the moonlighting. And so this is even uh, although now on small numbers, but this is confirmed by the fact that not only the uh, short linear motifs are enriched in EMF compared to the uh, non-candidates and the hubs, but there is a particular category of ELM, which is named, that they have named the switch ELM, and they, they, are, they are small linear motifs which are known, which are, uh, which are triggering uh, um, uh, processes, and we are also enriching those, and in particular in allosteric ones. So he, 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 because of this allosteric uh, uh, enrichment here, we may think that in some candidates we have a conformational switch uh, due to this. All these candidates have been uh, put into a database, which is called MoonDB, uh, which is, so here, this is the second version, so it has been uh, developed by Diogo and Lionel, and uh, the third version with a new interactome, because we are updating it every year, because the interactome and the uh, GO annotation are changing. So the third uh, version is coming. So if you are not, if I don't want to kill you too much, we can stop a little bit and then stop, restart with the protein RNA. Okay, are you ready for the RNA? Yeah. <laughs> so these are these ones. As nice as the other one. So these interactions, they are, they are, uh, there is, 
there is a lot of work uh, around this um, interactions nowadays because in fact um, uh, some years ago um, some methods have been developed which allows us to identify protein RNA interactions at large scale. And this method, which most of the time involve cross-linking the RNA with the protein they interact with, and then uh, you can sequence the uh, RNA, and then you can identify by mass spec proteomics uh, the proteins which are bound to the RNA, led the people who had made this experiment to discover that, in fact, half of the, uh, of the proteins that they have found did not contain any of the known domains. You remember what I told you at the beginning? You had protein interaction domain, but you have also protein RNA domains, which are uh, described here. The, for, the, for the known ones. And in fact, half of the proteins bound to the RNA didn't have any of the known, um, of the known domains. So this, again, means that uh, the space of the interactions in which we are is huge and unknown. So uh, what we know since then is that uh, Protein RNA interactions, this is quite different from uh, protein DNA, inter uh, protein, uh, protein interactions. I showed you only two protein pr domain domain and domain short linear motifs. But here, look at all the conditions for all the things that we know for protein RNA interactions. So here, this is the regular one the domain that we know, which is able to uh, recognize a particular sequence. But the problem is coming mainly from this. We have low specificity uh, RNA binding uh, of the proteins. And sometimes some proteins are able to recognize only two nucleotides on the RNA. And with stuff like this, it's very difficult to, to have an idea of uh, of the RNA. So some proteins, you can look at this here, they, we know that they also have a tendency to, uh, to bind through their disordered region. And some proteins are recognizing structure in the RNA and so on. And here, so you can recognize here, this is the aconitase I told you about. The, the moonlighting protein, which is a RNA binding protein also, which is recognizing a structure. Okay, so all this to say that the space is huge. In human, we have, if we don't consider the post -tra uh, translational modification, we have uh, like 20,000 uh, uh, proteins. We know that uh, more than 50% of the human genome is transcribed and leading to a space of uh, RNA of something like uh, 2,000. So <clears throat> among this RNA, there are several uh, biotypes. And one of them are the long non-coding RNA. So they are transcribed. RNA, but which so far don't uh, encode any proteins. So far, Sebastian, you know why I'm saying this. <laughs> and um, in fact, this uh, lung coding RNA are able to interact with a lot of proteins for some of them. So they do this. The function that we know for this long coding RNA through interaction of, uh, with, uh, with uh, uh, proteins, <clears throat> they are, some of them are involved in uh, regulation of uh, transcription. Some of them are somehow nucleating and sequestering proteins in, 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 uh, in some situation. Some of them play the role of decoy, and some of them are 
playing are helping to organize protein complexes. We don't know a lot about this because so only a dozen of cellular scaffolding link RNA are known so far. And again, most were found by chance. Uh, why? Because in fact, in most of the experiments, when a biologist want to identify protein complexes, at some point, they put an RNAs in their tube, which is an enzyme which is degrade the RNA. And so if there is an RNA component in their complex, they just digest it. So they cannot see it. So this is what is said here. OK, so here this is uh, an example of uh, the telomerase complex, which is, for, for this one, it's uh, very well known. Uh, uh, the, the, the um, location of the interaction of, a, uh, so here the DNA, here the, uh, it's a kind of a template RNA to reconstitute the telomere, to synthesize the telomere. And we know exactly where all the part of the DNA, of the RNA, which is highly structured, as you can see, uh, bind with, uh, where it binds with all the members of the complex. Okay, so the question that we have asked is, what is the extent to which link RNA organize or scaffold or nucleate protein complexes? And are we able to define a functional landscape of scaffolding link RNA at the proteome level? So to do this, we proposed, obviously, a network approach. So, as I told you, for uh, protein RNA interactions, the network are far less deciphered than for protein-protein interaction. So in this case, we uh, used a predictor of protein RNA interactions, which have been developed by uh, Gian Gaetano Tartaglia groups at the CRG of Barcelona. So, uh, for this part of the work, we, we collaborate with, uh, uh, with the, group, the group in Barcelona. So this, this algorithm is called CatRapid. So it predicts interaction in between protein RNA, uh, in, in between protein and RNA. And it's based, it, it's a, a, a learning algorithm, which is uh, trained, in fact, on, uh, on um, protein RNA complexes which, for which we have uh, the structure, and it computes an interaction profile which is based on the physical chemical properties of the amino acids and the nucleo forming the, the, the proteins and the nucleotide forming the RNA. And the secondary structure, the RNA is able to, uh, to form in order to get an interaction propensity for each protein RNA pair. So by doing so, we have so um, <clears throat> predict the protein link RNA network for, uh, all, for uh, 15,000, uh, 16,000 uh, uh, proteins and 15,000 uh, link RNA. And we got six million of positive interactions in between link RNA and proteins, which are co-expressed at least in one tissue, according to the uh, to the uh, expression uh, data. And just for fun, I show you here the size of the interactome that we have seen so far, and here the size of the protein-RNA interaction network in proportion. So you can see that here the, the space is, is just tremendous. So uh, the, the uh, approach that we have proposed once we had this six million interaction is to uh, look for protein groups, what we have called protein groups, which are formed, in fact, by uh, protein complexes, which have been found in large-scale experiments here, or uh, annotated, known in the literature, and the network modules that we identified in 
our uh, with our OCG algorithm like I showed you uh, before. So here you have the details of all the all the data set we have used. So here current database, these are the annotated ones. Here these are the different uh, type of uh, uh, um, data set of complexes that we have used. So the, the, those ones, they are conserved across metazoans, our uh, network and some other uh, mass spec analysis. And what we have simply proposed, in fact, is to look for uh, the enrichment with an hypergeometric test to look for the enrichment of um, <clears throat> proteins of uh, the of a, an enrichment of the. Ah, I, I'm afraid to tell it in the converse. Okay, nourishment in link RNA interacting proteins among the complexes and the modules. So this is what is represented here today. And so in order to get the functional landscape at the proteome level. And so this is represented here again. So by doing so, we have identified uh, <clears throat> 847 uh, link RNA, which are organizing uh, 15, 1,500 protein groups, which account for, in fact, 50% uh, uh, of the pro protein groups that, that, that have been tested. So here, you can see, as I told you at the beginning, that we can have an idea of the prevalence of the mechanism uh, at the level of the link RNA. So those are the ones which are uh, scaffolding candidates and as well as at the level of the uh, uh, protein groups which are organized possibly by link RNA. So in addition, so this is what I just told you. So some link RNA may act as general scaffold. So this is what you can see in these matrices. So here you have link RNA as lines and complexes as rows. And uh, so you can see that uh, some uh, link RNAs are kind of uh, promiscuous like here, whereas some complexes can be organized by a lot of, uh, a lot of RNA like here. So, um, so this is what I just told you. And what was neat is that, in fact, we have been able to make these networks by looking at these yellow uh, nodes here. They represent the link RNA. And the colored ones, they represent uh, the complexes. And in fact, there is an edge in between uh, the link RNA and the complexes when the link RNA and at least one protein of the complex have been identified independently as involved in the same disease. And like this, you can see that we have quite a lot of uh, uh, link RNA, which, and, and so this, uh, uh, result uh, help us to propose that in fact the scaffolding by the link RNA could be one of the dysregulated function in this in this disease. Yeah. Uh, and here, uh, can, can you check, like, for instance, for GWAS variant data in the link RNAs or, or, or We have tested. Some variants or common diseases are, are in the long Yeah, I don't remember if Diogo has done it. No, I don't think so. Or maybe he tried. I don't, know. I don't remember. I cannot tell you. So here, this is just an example of a, of a, a, a neat example because so uh, <clears throat> this link RNA, the Xing one link RNA. So is, is known to be associated, so here is the link and RNA. So it has been associated to uh, hepatocell carcinoma. And in fact, um, it's, it's known to in fact suppress 
uh, a, a mirror, and which is known to act on proteins of the uh, TNF alpha signaling pathway. But in fact, we found that in addition with our experiment that this uh, link RNA is able to bind uh, proteins of uh, the pathway, and this is statistically uh, significant, significant, in fact. And so, in fact, <clears throat> uh, it's possible also that this link RNA has a direct association in between uh, the, the, the proteins of the TNF and uh, the, uh, the, the, yes, with the protein in the TNF in the, in, in the, in the disease. So, as a conclusion, sorry. When it binds what? Yes. I have no idea because these are some of the, uh, so the action of this, we don't know. We don't know. But it's, as a matter of fact, in fact, we found that this link RNA is also associated with these four proteins uh, of the, of the, of the uh, signaling complex, letting us maybe to think that there is something else than uh, the, the regulation through the MR, the, the mirror, but maybe a direct regulation in between the complex and the link. So as a conclusion, I hope to have shown you that in fact from, uh, uh, from networks, we can also try to get information about biological processes. We can have, uh, so by uh, the two large scale approaches that I have uh, uh, present you, so these are the data sets that we have, uh, uh, that we have uh, uh, produced and which are, uh, which are available, of course. We have found also this signature of extreme multifunctionality and uh, we have shown that this short linear motif may have a role in multifunctionality. And this work is now, in fact, uh, with this signature, we are now working on a, uh, on a project with uh, uh, some um, computer people in computer science who are uh, working on uh, multi-view machine learning. And so we just have produced 14 proteome interactome-wide data set in order to describe and try to get uh, to differentiate uh, extreme multifunctional proteins from uh, multi-clustered non-candidate uh, from our network. Um, here, this is something about the prevalence of the, uh, of the, of the uh, processes that we have proposed, and maybe this story of disease also, which is interesting. Okay, so all this work have been done by most of the, so the link RNA have been made by uh, mainly Diogo. The Charles has, the, has uh, done the moonlighting, the first part of the moonlighting uh, story. Lionel has, is working on everything. <laughs> Alexi has made uh, all the data set I told you about the, 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 for the, the multi-view machine learning. Emmanuel developed the, uh, the algorithm and Galadriel developed also the uh, the MoonDB database. These are the people of the group now, former people involved in the project, collaborators, funding. Thank you. Thank you.